Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, we'll be getting started in just a few minutes. We're going to allow for people to filter into the Zoom webinar for a minute or two. Hey, well, we'll just go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us tonight, uh, this, this afternoon. Um, hello, um, I'm Linda Mitchell, CEO of Allergy and Asthma Network. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar. We're here for a real treat today with Dr. Mike Pistoner from, uh, as today's presenter. Uh, Dr. Mike and I have worked together for many years in the past on food allergy, re allergy related uh, topics. Um, I'm a food allergy mom myself, so um, I'm looking forward to this. And um, this one should be fun and as well as educational. We have a few housekeeping items before we get started today. First, all participants will be on mute for the webinar. We will be recording today's webinar. It's actually already recording. And we'll post the link to the recording on our website within a few days. You can find all of our recorded webinars on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. You just scroll down to, on the bottom of the homepage and you'll see a list of current and most recent webinars along with a link to prior recordings. This webinar will be one hour in length and that includes times for questions throughout as we proceed through the webinar. So keep adding your questions and uh, so we can answer them as we go along. We will take those questions, but you can, um, you can put them in at any time. The Q&A box is at the bottom of your screen. We have someone monitoring the chat, chat and the Q&A. Um, so if you need any help, just let us know. And we'll get to as many questions as we can before we conclude today's webinar. We will not be offering continuing education credits for this webinar, but we do have a certificate of attendance if you need it for your records. A few days after the webinar, you will receive an email from us with supplemental information, as well as a link to download the certificate for your records. So um, we'll also try adding the link to the certificate in the chat today. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so let's get started. Today's topic is holidays with food allergies. Anxiety around managing food allergies is a year round concern, but it can increase as we approach the winter holidays. Learn how to navigate this holiday season safely with food allergies. We hope this will help you find the safest and lower stress options to navigate these sometimes complicated situations, whether you're a caregiver of someone with food allergies, a patient yourself who has food allergies, or a school nurse or other healthcare professional. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Mike Pistoner. Dr. Pistoner is the Director of Food Allergy Advocacy, Education, and Prevention for the Mass General Hospital Children's Food Allergy Center. He is a fellow in the American Academy of Pediatrics and a member of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology and the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Dr. Mike is also the author of Everyday Cool with Food Allergies, a children's book, and co-author of Living Confident with Food Allergies, handbook, and co-founder of the website allergyhome.org. So thank you, Dr. Mike, for being here today. Let's get started. Thanks for having me. You bet. Yeah. Um, so you want to go take this one on food allergy management. I know this is your, your thing about prevention and em emergency preparedness. Yeah. So in thinking about any circumstance we want to prepare for, um, we need to have food allergy management strategies when we're taking care of a kid or ourselves with a food allergy at all times and in all circumstances. And so holidays are one of those times and circumstances and food allergy management 
is two pillars, the pillars of prevention and emergency preparedness. For prevention, we're gonna to wanna to act to prevent accidental exposures, avoid, communicate, and teach. Um, in order to avoid, we read labels. We understand and prevent cross contact. Uh, we communicate with the child who has food allergies, all people who are serving them, people we're interacting with. In the case of the holidays, many times it's friends, family, hosts. Um, we teach, we teach our children, and then we wind up teaching the people who sometimes are gonna be uh, serving us food, hosting us, or coming in our homes. As far as the pillar of emergency preparedness, we want to be prepared to react, to recognize a severe allergic reaction, to recognize anaphylaxis, to know when and how and be able to administer epinephrine when needed, and to be able to activate 911. Um, and so we're going to want to have this plan, these food allergy pillars, and take them with us on our holiday vacations and or when we have our family and friends join us. I think you're muted, Linda. Sorry about that. Um, so I know that you and I have talked a lot about um, age appropriate um, education for children and getting them involved in their self-management. So um, would you like to talk about this and then the new handouts that the um, American Academy has published recently regarding this? Yeah, well, so the participation of our kids in their own food allergy management is going to be always an important thing in any of the settings. And in the holiday setting, this is going to be where um, Things are a little different than they usually are. When our kids know what their roles are in school or in our own homes, this is standard, this is traditional. Now, oftentimes in the holidays, things get shaken up a little bit and we may be at other people's turf. And the kids are going to have different ability to have different responsibilities, ranging from the little child who's exploring their hands or, or the environment with their hands in their mouths and putting objects in their mouth 80 times an hour to the teenager who is going to be able to read labels, wash their hands, communicate with people serving them and be able to really self-manage sometimes even better than us parents can do for them. Okay, great. Um, and for those of you who might be interested in having access to these handouts, they're free. Um, they're available on the um, aaaai.org website, but the easiest way to get to it is really just type into a Google browser, Food Allergy Ages and Stages Handouts, AAAAI, AAAAI, four A's and an I, and you will find them. They're the first thing that comes up, and they're just wonderful little handouts that um, I encourage you to take a look at, and they're available in Spanish. So and now, we'll move, go ahead. they will reinforce those pillars. They get at the prevention and the emergency preparedness, and then they will be targeted for the age group of the child who you have. And so um, hopefully those will be really helpful. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they're, they'll be good for school nurses too, wouldn't you think? Certainly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what I would think too. Okay, we can move to the next slide. So now we're gonna um, talk about different things that we can do to keep our children safe or ourselves safe if we have a food allergy. So the first topic is kind of a big one, lots of uh, you know angles to it, but cross contact, it's a big issue. So Dr. Mike, what exactly is cross contact and how can we kind of be careful about cross contact? Cross contact is when unexpected allergen makes it into the food that shouldn't have the allergen in it. And so this could be something that happens with transfer from an object. So if a serving spoon was in the mashed potatoes and the mashed potatoes have dairy in them, and then that serving spoon goes into the cauliflower, now the cauliflower may have some dairy in it. That's an example of cross contact. Uh, a peanut butter knife that goes in the jelly jar, um, those are kind of physical. Um, those are are 
utensils that ultimately have allergen on them. Other sources of cross contact also can be splatter. If food is prepared and splatters on food next to it, um, if multiple dishes are put in the oven to heat up and something drizzles on something else, those could be examples of cross contact. Um, hands and saliva can also have cross contact. So if I am preparing something and I have dairy in my hands or some sort of nut product, and then I kind of just wipe them off and move on to the next thing and now serve my guests, I may also then have allergen that I transfer that way. Saliva can also have it. So this is going to come into play when we have children visiting other children and lots of little kids who are putting lots of things like Sophie the giraffe in their mouth. And then another little kid goes and puts the same object in their mouth. If they just ate allergen, that's something that can cause cross contact. Um, Buffets, which sometimes are quite popular at uh, um, at the holiday tables. Um, this is where, as mentioned before, any utensil that's used in one dish and go, goes to the next um, uh, can transfer allergen. Um, and so each family is going to have different issues when we're celebrating our holidays. Um, and every family has kind of different styles of serving and preparing food. And so, Linda, we were talking a little bit about this in the past. Um, what have you done uh, when you've been hosted as far as trying to prevent cross contact? Well, I try to bring some safe dishes so I know my son could eat whatever something there, you know, in case the rest of it wasn't safe. Um, but also I had him go first on a buffet line so that everything was untouched. The utensils were all clean and he could get his safe meal. And then he went on to eat it while everybody else went up and got it. So that was how I tried to avoid cr cross contact in that situation. Um, another thing I'll just add is cross contact can happen on manufacture production lines. Do you want to talk about that, Dr. Mike? Yeah, well, that, so kind of pulls us back a little bit to labeled reading. And so with labeled reading, when we see those cautionary statements, um, those cautionary statements, each family is going to be a little bit different the way they roll as far as whether they include or exclude. Um, that'll be something that the allergist and or the healthcare team is going to work through with the family. There's going to be some kids who can eat baked in egg, and they're going to have different things that they need to include or exclude. But those cautionary statements that we see on a label, which then imply that there could be in a manufacturing potential allergen that gets in that item, um, some Studies have been done, and one specific to nuts uh, showed that there was a 7% chance that when there was a cautionary statement for a peanut, that there was detectable peanut. And so um, in some of the cases, it wasn't um, necessarily high enough to cause an allergic reaction, and in some it was. And so ultimately, if there is uncertainty of um, whether the person you're serving or whether a person with an allergy needs to avoid cautionary statement for that food entirely. If there is a cautionary statement, avoiding is the safest thing to do. Um, and uh, um, the language has also been looked at. And so it doesn't seem to, with it, bring actual risk with different language. For example, if it says may contain traces of, it didn't necessarily have higher testable quantities than the ones that said produced in a facility. Because the FDA doesn't regulate the use of these terminology. Um, and so it, currently as things stand, uh, you can't necessarily look at that thing and then determine whether or not once you have a cautionary statement it is risky or not 
And we're going to thank you for that. And then we're going to, it's a lot complicated before, than before when we used to say avoid everything, but now it's more nuanced based on the child and shared decision making and all kinds of other things. So it's a really good point to bring up. Um, and uh, Wendy mentioned shared drinks, you know, people drinking out of the same cups or straws. That's a really good thing to keep in mind too, that that can eat that little bit. And I know we'll talk about this later with pets, but do you want to kind of just mention the pet food thing? And Yeah. I mean, there's also, if a pet eats food, like a peanut treat and then smooches the kid, then that kid may have skin contact and also oral exposure if um, if, if they're licking right in the kid's face. Um, and so thinking about some of those things that a child with a food allergy may come in contact with. And then if we have infants and toddlers who may eat directly from the pet's bowl, then they might be eating the pet food themselves. Um, so not only is it gross, but it could cause an allergic reaction if it happens to have it in it. They say that about 40% of dog food can have egg in it. These are things to keep in mind. Um, cat food can have fish. So these are things to be somewhat cognizant and thinking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Other things to think about with cross contact would be, you know, everybody likes a good kazoo. So musical instruments sometimes are something that's cracked out on the holidays. And so if a bunch of kids are passing around um uh a uh, um oh i'm forgetting the name of the thing that like causes horrible noises but any any blowing type musical instrument would be something you want to be be thinking about if your kid is one of many and everybody just ate yeah and, and lastly you brought up the dog kissing a kid but but how about grandma or aunt so-and-so kissing a child after having consumed food with allergens in it yeah so i mean so these are so skin does a good job keeping allergen out and so getting a a, a kiss on the cheek could cause local rash or hives if you get a good amount of allergen on there um in like 30 to 40 percent of the time the issue there would be if the kid then rubs it off and then puts their hand in their mouth um, the issue also is that, you know, if grandma open mouth kisses the kid, we're going to have many problems, uh, but, uh, um, but skin does a good job. So if a kid gets a kiss on the cheek, they can wipe it off. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on to the next slide. So reading food levels, you had touched on that, but I'll let you take it from here, um, to go over the top nine food allergens and the labeling laws that. Um, affect label reading? So relatively recently, um, sesame was added. So we went from the top eight to the top nine. And so peanuts, tree nuts, wheat, dairy, fish, eggs, shellfish, soy, sesame are the major allergens. Now on a label, when one of these allergens is included in an item, even if it's in flavoring um, or spices, it has to be in plain language and it has to be on the label. So this is new for sesame. One thing that happened when sesame was added was some of the manufacturers started adding genuine sesame to new items that never had sesame before. And so anybody who is going to be reading labels for sesame is going to need to be cognizant of this. If it says sesame on the label, then these days that means business. So you're going to want to avoid it um, just like you would with any of the other uh, major eight. So for all the major nine, if you see the allergen on the label, then taking it seriously and avoiding it is the way to go. Now, having labels is going to be key to label reading. And when you are being hosted by others, Sometimes you may not have access to the labels. And I would then advise avoiding the items that you didn't get to know were read by somebody who knows how to read labels. And label reading isn't the easiest thing. Now, if you have relatives or friends who are willing to learn, being able to train them how to read a label, then you could rely on that, especially if, um, if you know that they know what they're doing. Sometimes when we 
visit others. We happen to be going to other homes where they have a kid with a food allergy and label reading is something that they're good at. Um, sometimes when we visit others, they don't have time to necessarily know. They may ask you questions that let you know that they may not really be familiar with what's going on. And then you're not going to want to rely on them. Being able to get the label yourself is going to be important. But then as Linda and I were talking about before, if the food was already plated, cross contact is still something that could have happened. Um, and so being able to actually get to the item when it comes straight out of the package is going to be really helpful. And being able to potentially be part of choosing, purchasing, serving is going to be the safest. Okay, great. So, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, convenience options now where you can get a whole Thanksgiving dinner from a, you know, Italian gourmet shop or something like that, or even just the grocery store. Um, so talk about the labeling laws and how that does or doesn't impact on whether you'll find out what's in them. Well, being able to, so I think it's important to be able to know that the label of each of the ingredients is accessible. So if someone were to cook a dish that has six things that go in that dish, we're going to need to have access to, or the chef will need to know that each of those dishes that go into the larger dish, all labels will ultimately need to be looked at in order to know that whatever the kid is eating doesn't have allergen in it. Now, this is really potentially tough if someone else is preparing the food. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, especially if, and this is gonna come up later, if the food allergy is not necessarily discussed at the time of food prep, then it can be really challenging to make sure that each of those kind of micro ingredients is safe and that no cross contact occurred while putting them together and preparing the food. So this is where farming it out from another place can be tricky. And sometimes if someone were to go to a grocery store that has some of the buffets that then have the labeling that you still can have the issue of cross contact. And sometimes it's hard to keep those labels accurate. Mm -hmm. And also the labeling law does not apply to meals ready to eat and take out food. So um, you may or may, stores might put the label, the ingredients on them, but they may not. And that's not a violation of the law, unfortunately. There's some loopholes in the labeling law. Um, it, it certainly improved things from what it used to be, but um, just be cautious about stuff like that as well. So um, let's see, I think we had a question and let me back up for just a minute. Um, let's see. So going back to the previous slide, um, is there a determined time frame when the allergen remains in saliva after someone ingests an allergen? There was a cool study done looking specifically at peanut and they did different things to try to decrease the amount of salivary peanut. So grown-ups ate peanut product, and then they did testing to see if there was detectable peanut in the saliva after they did several things like toothbrushing, mouthwashing. Um, and so toothbrushing did not take it down to undetectable. Mouthwashing did not take it down to undetectable. Waiting several hours later and having a peanut-free meal did. And so um, that's been the recommendation and guidance that people have been given. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to move on to dealing with relatives, well-meaning relatives who don't understand food allergies or have traditions that they don't want to change because of food allergies. Can you talk about that? How do you deal with well-meaning and enthusiastic relatives? Yeah, so the 
well-meaning and enthusiastic, sometimes people put a lot of love in their food and then sometimes it can also include allergens. And so um, even if somebody really tries really hard, if they don't know what they're doing, then it may not be safe. And sometimes some people can take offense and some people really like it when kids really enjoy eating their muffins or cookies or what have you. Um, and so this is where having some conversations, um, especially in the older kids who kind of are starting to have an awareness. Um, so this will be conversations with many different people, one of which being the kid. Um, and understanding that, you know, someone's trying really hard, that they really care about them. But then at the same time, the giving the child the opportunity to say no thank you. And so while everybody wants to be a pleaser, you can't be a pleaser when it comes to food when you have a food allergy. And so practicing saying no thank you and also letting the kids know which of the grown-ups are okay to give food to the child to eat. And so in some circumstances, especially like some folks have gone to holidays where you have like two dozen people there and lots of relatives all over the place and having the point people for the people who can say which food is okay and which food is not okay. I would probably actually say which food is okay. So this way, no one's going to eat something otherwise without it really truly being vetted. But if Aunt Millie comes at a kid with a muffin, then the kid should know that mom and dad and grandpa Joe, they're the only people who can tell me that this is okay or not. So I'm going to come bring them over and have a conversation with Aunt Millie. Um, and so now that's going to be where you don't want to take a chance. And after some understanding or some teaching, I think that most of us have relatives and friends that would be reasonable enough not to take offense. Yeah, that's true. Now, there's certain cultural, you know, situations where food equates love and they're going to get hurt feelings no matter what. And so how do you navigate that? Do you just kind of, I know you've got to stay firm, but how do you try to navigate Yeah, I mean, that explaining that it's nothing personal. Um, explaining that, oh, these are the rules that we always follow and we need to have a label and we don't have a label. Thank you so much for doing this for us. Um, and I'll eat it, <laughs> but not my kid. And so there may be all different ways to kind of approach it. Maybe the, the, the sibling without the food allergy could get a double serving. Uh, and so these would be ways that you would want to navigate that within your own family, throwing in some humor, making it not personal, and certainly being careful not to be snippy or express disappointment, especially if they tried and then they got it wrong. Um, and so I've been in ex it, situations where hosts have tried so hard and then there's just one slip up in there that made that meal something that couldn't be eaten. And man, as much as it's tough on the kid, it's really tough on the host who now feels terrible. So being able to be gracious about that and then also, this also builds a little bit of resilience in our kids. And then being able to kind of figure out and problem solve and find stuff that they can eat. And then if there isn't much that they can, then reward them for their patience and their amazingness later. Exactly. And so, um, you know, bringing along at least something as a backup plan can also always be a safe kind of option to do so that you're not completely relying on the host and that can take some pressure off of a situation with a hungry child. <laughs> Great, okay. Well then I think we can move on to the next slide, thank you. So working with your host. So I've had great success with working with hosts over the years where you know I'm gonna go say to my sister's house and she understands the severity of the situation but she also doesn't feel 100% comfortable cooking. And so 
you know, I'm able to get together with her ahead of time and say, okay, well, you want to use this kind of chicken stock, this brand, and you want to use this kind of something and this kind of something. And so I kind of guide her into what ingredients to buy. And then usually I get there and I help her prepare it. So that's kind of how I've been working it all these years. But um, why don't we hear what you have to say about it? And maybe you have some additional ideas for how to approach it. Same. Um, and a little different based on the relative or the host that we're visiting. And so in some cases, them actually creating and serving and preparing all of the food works out. And I've been in some circumstances where they've actually tried to make all of the food allergen free. Um, I've also been in circumstances where we brought the food that my son was going to consume. Um, and then we put it in a particular place where it wouldn't have any cross contact with any of the other food. Then we participated in getting the utensils to serve the food. And so this way we knew that the food would be safe for him, um, but we brought it ourselves and then actually would heat it up at the host's house. So this way it was essentially um, uh, freshly served and not all that um, boring. Yeah, I think your point about always having a contingency plan is a good one. I think I kind of referenced that about bringing something along just in case. Um, do you want to comment on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, so this, beyond the holidays. And, and I think that we're going to get into some of this, especially around traveling with the holidays, but having backup food, if you're going to be in a situation or a circumstance for a while, and you're not going to have access to food that you know is okay, then being totally hangry is no fun. And so having something that travels easy with you, um, like beef jerky, like rice cakes, like potato chips. Um, those will be things that can be useful to hold you over if you are stuck in the airport, if you wind up at that host's house and they truly have nothing because the walnut stuffing touched everything, then having some backup can be really useful. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Okay. Um, any other thoughts about this? Oh, I guess we're going to go on to pets. <laughs> Thank you, Courtney, for moving the slide. So what about a host pet? Um, there's, there's pet allergies, but then there's the pet food that we already kind of touched on. Do you want to talk a bit, little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, so like as far as the food allergen in pet food, then we got the uh, peanut treats for that dogs munch on. We got egg um, sometimes dairy and some of the food that the animals are going to be eating, potentially fish and some other foods that the animals eat too. And so this picture actually has a nice demo of one of the things that we need to be thinking about here, which would be if the pet just ate that food and smooches the kid, now we're going to have skin exposure. And then in this case, potentially sal salivary exposure as well. Um, and so this will be something to think about. Then in the younger kids who are crawling around on the floor and they happen upon the dog food and they eat it, then that's going to obviously be an issue if it has allergen in it. Um, another thing is, is that many of the people who have food allergies also have environmental allergies, including pet allergies. And so if you are crashing at your relative's house and they have cats or dogs, and someone in your family is allergic to cats or dogs, then that can be tricky. And so in those cases, bringing your own pillow is nice, bringing an inflatable mattress, not having the kid lay down on the mattress that the dog or the cat likes to hang out on. Um, those will all be really useful. Um, the allergist may work with you or your primary care doctor may work with you for certain antihistamines or medication that you can use prior to visiting. So this way you can visit it and have a good time. There are some kids who are exquisitely allergic and may have asthma exacerbations if they sleep over. In that case, 
making sure you have a hotel room that's close enough to be able to hang out and have fun and then get out um, and taking asthma medicines and being uh, um, staying on the maintenance medicine and having the reliever medicine available if needed. Oh, great. Okay, we, I guess we can move on to the next slide then. Um, so here you are, be the host. That's another alternative for holidays. Do you want to talk about that? And I can talk about my experience. Yeah, I mean, you have control. So that way, when uh, you are the host, you really can um, prepare any of the dishes that would be the routine for serving the child with a food allergy. You also can invite other people to bring food. So now it's almost the flip. So if other people are serving or preparing food outside of your house, you don't necessarily know that that dish is going to be safe. So you at least have all of the safe dishes, including the primary ingredients. So you can whip something up for anybody in your own home. Um, and then if you want your guests to supplement, they can just again, remember and be cognizant of cross contact. Because many of you, when you are going to host other people and they're bringing their food, your kid or your family who's used to just sticking the spoon in whatever can't do that if you're going to allow the outside food in. So it's still going to be safe, but you're going to have to be thinking about cross contact and again, label reading if you're allowing other people to bring food in. Yeah. I agree with that. So, um, so my experience is my son, he's 33 now, and he's still anaphylactic to milk, even to small amounts. And so long time ago, I just said, look, it, I'll just make Thanksgiving. And so I can make a completely milk free, free Thanksgiving, including pumpkin pie. Um, but my family likes to bring something. So I tell them to bring a dessert. And um, I put that milk-free pumpkin pie on the counter first, and I let him take his piece of pumpkin pie, and then the rest of the desserts come out, and everybody goes to town on whatever else is left. So that way, anybody who wants to bring something can still bring something, but it's at the end of the meal, and they can bring out whatever they brought after my son has what he has that's safe for him. So... Um, I kind of do a little, you can have your cake and eat it too, so to speak. Um, but I kind of handle it that way. Nobody in my family knows that everything's milk free. I mean, I'll tell them and by that now they figured that out, but you can't tell. They stopped so coming. I <laughs> know they, they keep coming. <laughs> <laughs> free meal at my house, then my family will be there. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's how I've handled it all these years. And, you know, you, you can really accumulate some really wonderful recipes that are free of the allergens that you need to avoid for the most part. And so just keep an eye out for those and use safe substitutes in order to make what you need to make for any kind of given. And sometimes you just need to create new traditions with food um, so that if the foods that you traditionally brought um, and served for a holiday just need to kind of be retired and something else that's safe uh, that your whole family can enjoy can replace it. So that's sort of how I've navigated that all these years. It seems to have worked out well, and they're all going to show up next week again for me to cook everything up for them. What's also what I also like about hosting is especially if somebody is coming and they have dietary restrictions, mm -hmm. then we can like shower them with care. And yeah. it's nice to be able to then take care of somebody like you want to be taken care of. So that's one of the one, one of the cool things I also like about hosting. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we get the whole food allergy cross contact thing. And so if I have to make something that's also free of another allergen because of a guest coming to my house, I know how to do that. Um, I might have to kind of look around for safe substitutes for say egg or something, but I can do that. I know how to do that. So, um, so it all works out, but you're right. It's kind of a safe haven for someone with food allergies when they can go to somebody who has food allergies home. But what's interesting is it also gives me perspective when that happens. So if I have somebody visiting my home who actually has an allergy different from my kids, um, it actually makes me, I feel a little nervous. I want to yeah. make sure I'm not going to make a mistake. 
I make sure that I'm not just forgetting and just grabbing the same thing that I would normally. And it would be really poor form if you come to a pediatric allergist's house and he gives you cro <laughs> like cross contact with allergen. So it's like high stakes game if I'm hosting somebody with an allergy. I cannot get it wrong. <laughs> the pressure would be on you. Right? Oh, it's intense. <laughs> I, you know, I remember um, I was invited to someone's house with my son when he was maybe, I don't know, 15 or so. And um, she really said, please bring your son. I will do this. And she, she spent excessive care getting everything milk free for him and and but but afterwards she said i don't think i'm going to have your son over anymore because it was just too stressful and i can understand that because it would be stressful like you said if you were to have someone over your, uh, your home and it would be a little bit for me too i know i could do it but i'd have to really stay focused so that i didn't slip just like you were saying but I mean, there's also levels of hosting, right? Like we're talking right now, the level I'm talking about is me totally making a dish for somebody with an allergy visiting my home that isn't one of the ones that we deal with, right? I could yeah. do it and my training and my skills, like most parents of kids with food allergies, make it so I can do it safely. But my level of vigilance personally might be a little higher because this is not something that I'm used to. Then the next phase of it might be something like simpler dishes. Like I know how to boil pasta. I'm pretty good at it. And then we can make a, a easy dish that has simple ingredients. And then that makes it even easier. Then the easiest thing that I could do is purchase pre-made food that's sealed with a label and serve that to my guest, or they could bring their own. But any level of this type of ability to host someone um, uh, could and should be appreciated by the person with a food allergy. And I think one of the things that we haven't had a chance yet to talk about is that with holidays naturally comes uh, emphasis on food. But one of the things that I think is really helpful is de-emphasizing food and really emphasizing family, friends, togetherness, experiences. And so these are things where what we were talking about before is traveling with your backup food. Like, look, you just got to be able to like keep your calories up so you can have all the fun you can. It's not a big focus on the food. So being able to make it so there is going to be that comfort and that fun is ultimately what I think is a great goal as opposed to a fabulous, yummy holiday dinner. That would be really cool, but sometimes that's not going to happen. That's a really good point. De-emphasize the food. Okay, we can go to the next slide. Oops. So the, it kind of is a good lead-in for this yeah, slide. Right here. Here. Is it okay to create new traditions? So, uh, so why don't you kind of tell take that one. Yeah, I mean, I think that that just springboards off of what we were just talking about here, where so like one family might like to make gingerbread houses with frosting that seals the corners together. Um, you may be able to, and you can, figure out new non-food driven experiences um, that can celebrate the holiday and celebrate with your family, but not necessarily focused on the food or the eating part. Very true. Yeah. And sometimes that takes some creativity and thinking, but there's a lot of suggestions out there now that you can kind of learn about and try and see how everybody does. But yeah, just getting out of the house, doing something else. Family walk. Yeah. Yeah. All kinds of things. Um, so great. Well, thank you very much. Um, let's go to the next slide. Finding safe food during holiday travel. So do you want to talk about airplanes, grocery stores in strange locations, hotels with kitchens, and travel coolers? Yeah, so I mean, so now here, as far as holidays, this just brings us back to travel in general also, and back to those pillars of food allergy management, prevention, and emergency preparedness. So wherever you are, you're going to need these. Whether you're in the car on that car ride, whether you are in the airport, on the airplane. And so this is going to be where having some backup food and food that you're going to be able to know that you can eat with a label when you are in your like 
transition of your travel. So for example, you go to get on the highway, you are driving to a relative way out west. There is a gas station. You guys got stuck in traffic and now everybody's starving. Then a bag of chips may be something that can be pulled off. Um, getting that hot dog that was sitting on the roasting thing that was just sitting there for three years and there's no label would be a bad idea. And so being able to think about what you would do, but that's where preparedness comes in super handy. And I think that Linda, you were kind of telling me that in your, your past experiences, you'd sometimes have like a cooler and have stuff for travel. Yeah. Used to carry a little cooler with all kinds of snacks and, uh, you know, I made it, I made it kind of a conversation with my son. What would you like to take on the plane with you? So that he knew, you know, he was okay with the fact that that's how he would eat. And this was way back when, when they actually serve food on airplanes <laughs> um, and, and meals and things like that. So, yeah. So I kind of made him have some choices so that he, he kind of felt comfortable about what he would bring. And, you know, but there, there, I remember one time I had an eight hour drive across the state of Pennsylvania and I really was looking for a place and it's pretty rural in certain parts of the inner inside the state. And I didn't find any place to stop that I would feel comfortable at. So I ended up driving the eight hours, getting in the house and then having to cook dinner because there was just no safe options for him. But I held you know, I didn't take any chances because it wasn't worth it. Um, and that's and that's where some pre-planning is nice, especially with the holidays. Some Thanksgiving traffic can be brutal and you could get trapped in the car for a really long time. And so that's where having a little bit of car food can go a long way. Then mm -hmm. if you're already late for the dinner and your kid is hangry and you show up at your relatives and now you're like screening food to make sure it's safe. That's like the perfect storm. So that's where being prepared and then also having those. And if you're trapped in the car, you might as well have that conversation <laughs> before you arrive. Um, I'm hoping that you're having that conversation well before you arrive, even when the purchasing of ingredients is happening. But um, this way, coming out of the car hangry, um, that would be the most challenging circumstance. Yeah. Oh, by the way, if you are then finding like hotels or Airbnbs near relatives or wherever you're traveling to, um, sometimes finding some of the places that actually have a kitchen are nice because if you're going to be there for the, the weekend or a long time and if your kid does have multiple allergies then you're able to actually uh, not necessarily have to rely on restaurants um, other than your host um, for all the other meals and being able to have your own um, uh, food to prepare or serve is nice um, that's the highest end you know having a kitchen but then just getting a refrigerator um, is also then going to allow you to bring perishable items and to be able to have that in the morning or whatever. Yeah, I used to stay at residence inns and places with a kitchen so I could cook. It was just the lower stress option for me a lot of times. And one thing I just want to mention about grocery scores, the stores is that you know, if you go, especially like from the East Coast to the West Coast, that different manufacturing plants might be producing the food. And even though it looks like the same brand and the same product, you should really check the labels because they may be made slightly differently in the production facility that's in a different part of the country. So again, label reading is something you do every time. I just want to reinforce that, especially if you're going outside of your local area where the labeling might be a little different because of the food being produced in a different manufacturing facility. Do you want to comment on that at all? Yes, <laughs> agreed. <laughs> and then international travel, then that's oh, going to yeah. just make, make uh, getting to know the labeling and the labeling laws even more important. Yeah, absolutely. And travel coolers are great. You know, you can plug them in, you can keep things hot or cold for a while. So I've used those as well. So good. All right. I think we're close to the end here. Um, Want to try the next slide? 
school celebrations. You want to talk about school celebrations? Yeah. Um, so lots of celebrations anywhere, not just school, are have been traditionally food centered. And this we talked a little bit about creating new traditions. The easiest thing in a school, especially for the school nurses out there, is to try to encourage celebrations to be non-food. That makes it really easy. Pencils, stickers, activity books, fun, games, songs. Uh, these are all really going to probably take the stress out of the classroom, out of the teacher, uh, and be able to not have to worry about allergens. Um, but traditionally, people have used food for celebrations. And so if that is going to happen, um, fresh fruits may be a great way to celebrate if you have to have food. Um, and then items with labels. And if there is going to be some sort of, especially if it's going to be um, any activity, avoiding food related activities that are part of the curriculum or part of any any learning is going to be really important because that could exclude a child with a food allergy from um, something that would be considered a learning experience in school. Um, and if possible, avoiding the allergen during the celebration is a nice way to um, to, to be inclusive. Um, and again, as I was mentioning, um, food-free celebrations are really what I would recommend. Um, and then also just in general, a, a nice healthy way to approach um, because there are many potential celebrations in the school year and there's a lot of unhealthy treats and snacks fed to the children. Um, and so, you know, um, this is a good way to also support healthy habits. That's great. We did have one question, Dr. Mike. Um, so is there any kind of certain cleaners or whatever that can be used to clean off surfaces in the classroom or even in the home so that the allergen can be removed? And can you also comment on hand sanitizers? Yeah. All right. So, um, so some, there was a, a study looking at different methods of cleaning for allergen. And so standard soap and water um, with a wipe work. You don't need bleach. You don't need um, Lysol. So those are great things to kill viruses and bacteria. But just like Purell, so an hand sanitizer desiccates and dries, really good at killing viruses and bacteria. But if you just take your alcohol and put it on allergen, it's still going to be there. You're going to need something that is going to mechanically move it away. So that's where wet wipes, soap and water with a dish rag not to be used again after cleaning the, the allergen. Um, Disposable wipes, careful with sponges, because if you clean something with a sponge and then you go and you clean another plate after you just cleaned up the milk, then that's going to transfer milk protein. And so this is going to be where using disposable things is going to be important um, if you are going to be then um, cleaning allergen. Mm -hmm. Very true. Um I don't know if this is completely in, in the lane, but do stickers that kids get still have gluten in them? Do you know? I have not heard of gluten being in stickers. Okay. I am hoping that when we give stickers to children, the children are old enough developmentally that they're not eating the stickers, licking the stickers, or putting the stickers in their mouth. And so this is where... Um, I have not heard of a problem with stickers. I have seen small babies put stickers in their mouth and that's a choke risk. Um, but other than the, from, the, from the gluten perspective, that hasn't been something that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you for that. All righty. Um, is there anything else we need to do in terms of school celebrations? I'm trying to think if there was anything. I mean, my son was a lot younger. And I mean, like inclusion right now is so much more, people are so much more compassionate about 
inclusion and making sure that children aren't left out. I, I'm sure with regard to food allergies that there's still a long way to go, but um, I just remember a first grade teacher with my son saying, I've always had an ice cream soda party at the end of the year and I'm not going to stop because of your son. And she had her soda party. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm just hoping that that kind of stuff doesn't happen too often anymore. But um... I guess uh, a final, like off springboarding off of what you were just saying, a final thought there would be where, you know, I'm talking about like non-food celebration. That's the easiest and yeah. the, the best. Then sometimes, and some of you school nurses are going to be in a school where there is a policy that you don't necessarily have the opportunity to change. And if food is being served, then what you can do is give the family of the kid with a food allergy a heads up. They will always appreciate it. Nobody likes just hearing or getting a letter sent home with the kid that today there was a celebration and they didn't have anything to eat and they just wanted to give you a heads up. Uh, if you can preemptively say, hey, a holiday celebration is coming up in two weeks. Um, can you please bring items that your child can eat? Let's also talk about it. This way, it gives the family a little bit of time to prepare. But I mean, obviously, it's best if they're isn't going to be that situation. But if there has to be and you have no control, um, then I would say giving the family a heads up and working with them to, to plan. Okay, great. So it's, uh, there's about three minutes left. I'm going to ask one more question, if you could just answer quickly, and then we'll just move on. Um, so um, do allergens stay on hand washed and air dry dishes or dishes washed in the dishwasher? So the mechanical movement of allergen away is going to be very effective. Let's pretend you take a plate and it's got like those like grime and, and old like crusty food on it. Not only is that disgusting, but that's possibly allergen. And so that's going to be something that you're not going to want to serve somebody with an allergen. But when the plates and the dishes and utensils go clean in the dishwasher, uh, you're good to go. Okay, great. All righty. Well, thank you for that. Um, well, I think we're going to go ahead and talk about our next webinar. We're going to be talking about, this is another Dr. Mike topic, but actually uh, we're going to have another speaker. It's emergency planning for children with asthma and anaphylaxis. We're going to have to follow up with you on something like that, like babies with anaphylaxis or something, because I know that that's a really passion project for you, Dr. Mike. That's um, my jam. Yeah, I know it is. So, so emergency planning for children with asthma and anaphylaxis is going to be on November 29th, and um, and we'll have a speaker there for that one. And then the following webinar, if you could go to the next slide, is COVID, flu, and RSV, how to stay healthy this winter. And Dr. Pervy Parikh will be talking about those topics and um, making sure that we all know how to stay as healthy as we can this winter. So um, I think that might be our last slide, but let's take a look and see. Uh, yep, it is. Okay. So thank you for joining us here today, Dr. Mike. You've been terrific as always. Always fun to work with you. Um, so hopefully we'll get to do that again sometime really soon. And um, we will just go ahead and let everybody get on their way today. It's 4.59. We're ending about one minute late. Again, thank you all for joining us here today. Um, I hope you learned some stuff. Um, the link to that Quad AI bunch of handouts was put in the chat. And if you still need it, just email um, us at webinar at allergyasthmanetwork.org and we'll get that to you. Um, and you'll see a follow-up email in about two, three days with some links to other resources as well as information about the upcoming next webinar. So thank you all for joining us. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. Happy holidays. You too.